Good morning. Good morning. Those of you that are now watching online, um, you will notice the cross in the back, and we uh, you don't normally get to see that, so that's that's a good thing. So this morning we're going to start off by just again welcoming everybody to the Easter sunrise or Easter resurrection Sunday service, um, and we want to welcome everybody that if you do not have a church home, we'd love to have you come here on a given Sunday. Next Sunday would be great because you won't have to hear me preach, you get to hear Rex. So, um, but uh, we're just gonna start off with some scripture reading. Real quick though, there is no junior church today, uh, but normally we do have junior church. Next week, Brittany Roach is teaching. And um, so, and then if you would like to go back and watch today's service or any other services, you can go and do so on Facebook Live or YouTube later in the day. Um, so we'll start off with some scripture reading, and then um, we will go move on with the service. Matthew chapter 27, verses 29 through 35 says this. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and a reed in his sight right hand. And they bow bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man, Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is said, the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. And when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And then we move on to verses 45 through 50 of Matthew 27, and it says, Now after the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama Sebastian, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately out of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone, let us see if Elijah will come and to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Madeline and the other Mary came to the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that who you seek, Jesus, who was crucified, he is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. We're thankful. We're thankful for those that are here. We're thankful for those that are watching online. We're thankful for all that you do for us, Lord. Lord, we pray that we just put aside our burdens, put aside our cares, put aside our struggles, put aside our worries, and help us to focus on serving you. Help us to work, work, focus on worshiping you. Lord, help us to lay everything at your feet and give it all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we'll ask that you stand and see, turn to page 270 in the garden. Amen. 
Facebook or any of that, we've been talking about words matter and the word matters. Uh, we're talking about, and actually my wife confronted me with that words matter this past week, but I'll leave that out of that um, because she was totally right and I was wrong. Uh, yeah, so I even got a recording of that now, that was dumb. But anyway, <laughs> um, and then the word matters, the word matters. And so it's good to know my wife listens to me when I preach, right? So um, I hope everybody here knows that Jesus died on the cross. And I hope everybody knows here that he's no longer dead. Um, and we celebrated a couple nights ago and went through that and we've been celebrating the fact that he did die for each and every one of us. And that includes you. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you're currently doing, he died for you. He died for me. The cool part is he didn't stay dead. And that's cool. And, and there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there today. And as a matter of fact, um, a great quote, and I hope I get this right. Rex just showed me this because I always tell him he's a conspiracy theorist. But he showed me something. The difference, I believe this is right. The difference between a conspiracy theorist and reality is about six months. So, um, and I, I, I love that quote. And so, um, but conspiracy theorists all over the place about Jesus rising from the dead. Um, if you go into schools and colleges or any of that, people will tell you it didn't really happen. And many people will say, try to explain the way the resurrection. There's some people that will tell you that what's it matter about the resurrection? So what if he rose? We don't need to believe that. So what's the point? Well, I'll tell you again, words matter. The word matters. And so if you believe the Bible, which we do, we believe the Bible is 100% true. And we believe that it's the word of God. And so we have to believe that he is no longer dead. And there's many theories of what happened to Jesus. And again, a lot of today is going, most of it's going to be this right here. I'm just going to read off some of the theories. And I want, I want you to listen to some of these theories. Some of you, these you probably have heard. Um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be going to Matthew 28. So if you want to turn there while I read these, there's a lot to read. There's the swoon theory, S-W-O-O-N. That proposes that Jesus did not actually die, but was in a deep coma or swoon from the severe pain and trauma of the crucifixion. While in the cool atmosphere of the tomb and with the stimulating aroma of the burial spices, he revived and was somehow able to unwrap himself and escape from the grave and was opened. And when he had showed himself to the disciples, they erroneously assumed that he had been raised from the dead. For that theory to be true, Jesus would have had to survive the massive loss of blood from the scourging, the nail wounds, and the spear thrust. He would have also had to survive being wrapped tightly in the linen cloths that were filled with hundred pounds of spices. Besides all that, in his extreme, extremely weakened condition, he would have had to endure more than 40 hours without food or drink, manage to unwrap himself, 
single-handedly roll the stone away from the inside of the tomb, walk out unchallenged by the guards, and then convince his followers he had actually been raised and miraculously raised. He had been dead and miraculously raised. He would have had to have had developed a strength to travel countless miles in that condition to make the many appearances to his disciples over a period of 40 days. Finally, he would have had to delude the apostles into thinking that he entered a closed room without opening the door and ascended to heaven before their eyes. The absurdity of this theory is too obvious to be accepted by any clear thinking person, believer or not. The no burial theory. That contends that there was actually no service and Jesus was never placed in the tomb and therefore would not have been on a, would not have been in it on Sunday morning. His body was instead thrown into a mass grave for criminals according to Roman custom, but neither J Jewish leaders nor the Russian guards would have bothered to secure the seal, the tomb, if they knew Jesus' body was not inside. Not only that, but to disprove Jesus' resurrection, they would only have to retrieve his body and put it on display. Then there's the hallucination theory. Maintains that whoever came claimed that Jesus had risen from the dead simply because of a hallucination, induced by an ardent expectation of his resurrection. But Thomas was not only a, but Thomas was not the only believer who was slow to believe that the Lord was alive again. Every gospel account makes clear that most of his followers, including the apostles, did not believe either before or after the crucifixion, that he would be raised. Besides that, how could he have been more than 500 people hallucinating in the exact same way? And then you got the telepathy, te te tele that's easy for me to say, telepathy, another theory. <laughs> and that proposes that there was no physical resurrection at all, but rather God sent divine telepathic, well, I can say it that way, messages to Christians that caused them to believe Jesus was alive. But the theory, among other things, makes the God of truth a deceiver and the apostles and gather right worse writers liars. And that such mental images did not come from God, they were defective and slow to produce the intended result, because in a number of instances Jesus was not recognized when he first appeared to individuals and groups who knew him intimately. And then two more. The seance theory suggests that a powerful spiritualist or medium conjured up the image of Jesus by means of a cult power and that his followers were thereby deluded into thinking that they saw him. But if that were so, how did they hold on to his feet, put a hand in his wounded side, eat a meal with him, seances dilly strictly in the non-corporal and ephemeral and are not made of such physical and tangible things as those? And then you got the mistaken identity theory. It's based on the assumption that someone impersonated Jesus and was able to dupe the whole crowd, his closest friends and companions, into thinking that he was really their Lord come back to life. But the imposter would have had to have himself scourged, crowned with thorns, pierced in his hand and feet, and wounded in the side to make such an impression even close to convincing. He would also have had to mimic Jesus' voice, mannerisms and other traits to an unimaginable degree of perfection. He would have had to steal Jesus' body from the tomb and hide it. He would have also had to be an insider among Jesus' followers in order to identify and talk convincingly with the many people that he met during his appearances. He would also have had to know exactly where to find the people on every occasion and been able to perform such illusions as materializing through walls and appearing and vanishing at will and he would have had to have prepared in advance even at the crucifixion to do all these amazing things because the first appearance was as early as resurrection morning. You see, so many people are out there trying to tell us things and trying to tell us that the word does not matter. But again, the only thing that does make sense is the word of God. There's people out there that will tell you different theories, conspiracy theories, and they'll go through all kinds of things. And there's at least... All kind, there's at least one other theory, and that's the one we're going to look at today. We're going to look at one more in depth. So, again, if you look, and we will try to read some of these. This is 28 verses um, sorry, 11 through 15. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priest, and all the things had happened. 
When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed, and it saying it commonly reported among the Jews to, until this day. You see, this, this passage lets us see the deceit that was done by his enemies. This passage lets us see the things that we're going to look at today. First of all, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. Look at verse 12. When they had assembled with the elders and had consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. They bribed the soldiers. Now think about this for a moment. If you've ever served in the military, you you will get... You bribe the soldiers to say, hey, tell us you're not doing your job correctly, basically. The soldiers could have been facing death due to some of the laws and everything during that time that the, the soldiers would have been facing death to allow somebody to come in and steal this body. It would, it would be so much true. In, and they did get a large sum of money, but what good is it if you're not going to be alive to, to spend it? And so that's the reason the Sanhedrin, because they had so the, they were so much deceitful and there was so much going on, they didn't hesitate to pay the big money. He was like, well, we'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go ahead and we'll give you some money and try this. And then he goes on and he says, I tell you what, tell them his disciples came at night and stole away while you guys were sleeping. Now think about that for a moment. And if you ever just read, some, how many times... In scripture today and in the world today, we just believe because mama said, or we believe what people tell us. And that's why I never want you to believe what King Gray says. I want you to see what the Bible says. That's the reason we're going through and saying words matter and the word matters. So I could tell you some crazy theory and you could believe it. And that's, that's true. But when you get in and you start reading the word, you start seeing that it's true and you start asking questions. Think about this for a moment. Go ahead and tell his disciples, tell them that he came at night and they stole his body away from him while he slept. So they paid them the money to help spread lies and not tell about his body. The Sanhedrin and the guards knew that wasn't true. But they said, we're going to pay you to do this just because we got to do something. Think about this. Otherwise, they would have come up with the, the, uh, this, this plan. They wouldn't have said this. The purpose of the plan was to hide the truth. Verse 14 says, and, it comes, and if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. Remember when I said that the soldiers would have been fearful of their life because they weren't doing their job? One illustration says it this way. By threatening to make an unfavorable report to seizure, the Jewish religious leaders had usually managed to have their way with Pilate. They knew he would not risk trouble with seizure over the disposition of Jewish corpse. If the Sanhedrin came to the soldiers' defense, the governor probably would have given them no more than a reprimand. By that resolution, the Jewish soldiers willfully rejected Christ, despite the evidence, and, they spirit, and this, that spiritual obstinacy gives testimony to the apostasy of their Israel leaders. I told you it was going to be short. Think about this for a moment. Why in the world would we see that the disciples come in and set, let the soldiers, while they're sleeping, they sneak in and they steal Jesus' body, and then they go ahead and go through, through all that. But if the soldiers were sleeping, how would they have seen that the, the disciples had come and stolen the body? We need to ask questions when we're reading Scripture. We see in verse 15, it says, So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported to in the Jews amongst today. You see, today, people are trying to explain away Jesus. Today, people are trying to explain away the resurrection. Today, people are trying to explain away the biblical truths that we hold in this Bible today. We in no way worship the Bible, but we worship the God of the Bible. We believe that it's true. We believe that it's inspired. Trying to explain his, away his resurrection, many for their own interests. If the soldiers were asleep, how would they have known that who stole the body? Many, many also ask, what, what about all these other theories? One person wrote these, and I wrote these, a lot of some of these down, says, all these theories fail. Explain how apostles went from cowards to bold as they became after seeing Jesus. 
You see what happened after, after they saw Jesus, spent time with Jesus after his resurrection. They were all willing to die, and many of them actually did. This all, why would you be willing to die over a hoax? Because if you remember, when he died, the disciples were all fearful, and they ran, and Peter denied him, and there's just all of them, they kind of ran away and said, I don't want any part to do with this because we're scared for our own lives. But after Jesus came back, that gave them the power and they was able to say, okay, this is true and I'm willing to die. So again, most of the disciples ended up dying uh, as martyrs. Explain where Jesus' body was. Think about this for a moment. If any of the deceit and any of the, the enemies would have been able to find Jesus' body, all that would have been dead. All the rumors would have been dead. You wouldn't have had any writings about it. The Jewish leaders who were Romans ever attempted to do this because they couldn't find his body. If he was still dead, I'm sure they would have found his body at some point. And then we see so many people trying to come up with theories today, trying to explain away Christians, trying to explain away the scripture. We see things in the world today of people trying to explain so many things of how this could happen, how that could happen, but none of them truly makes sense. The only thing that truly makes sense is that Jesus truly did die on the cross he truly did raise three days later. He truly did ascend into heaven. And he truly is alive today. And that's why we celebrate. You know, I almost started off this morning, and this is a pretty bold statement, but I almost started off this morning to say, Happy Easter, today's no big deal. But it is a big deal. But my point was, today's not a big deal. Many, and we just talked about this a few months ago. Every Sunday is a little miniature Easter that we're celebrating. That's why we have services, if you've ever wondered. That's why we have services on Sunday mornings instead of Saturdays. Because we believe Jesus rose again, and we are celebrating on Sundays to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So every Sunday is Easter. Now, again, this is the big Easter. But every Sunday we should be celebrating that we serve a risen Savior. So today really isn't that big of a deal. Now, again, please don't go home and tell anybody that I said that. Because it is a big deal. This is, a, this is around the time it happened and we should definitely honor it. But what I'm saying is we should be honoring his resurrection every Sunday, every day. We should be realizing we serve a risen Savior. Many people ask, why in the world would Matthew end this way? Jesus died for you, so what can we do? This is the very end of Matthew 28. Verse 16 says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. Some, some were still a little skeptic. And Jesus came back and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heavens and on earth. See, when he came down to earth and was born as we all celebrate Christmas, he had partial authority. He, he was still partial, partially human, but at this time he was fully God. All authority has been given to me. And here's what we need to do about it as Christians. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, if you're here this morning and you've never repented of your sins, if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus into your heart, we want to give you that opportunity. And, you know, and I, as I said before, so many times the preacher will stand up there and say, okay, you got to stand up, you got to come down to the altar, you got to be on your knees, you got to pray at the altar and say seven Hail Marys, or you got to sprinkle fairy dust on you, or you got to, finally you'll look different, you got to do this, you got to do that. We've got so many stipulations. But here's what I'm going to tell you to do. I'm not even going to tell you to bow your heads. I'm not even going to tell you to close your eyes. I just want you to pray to God right now in your mind. Say, Father, forgive me. Because it really is that easy. We try to make it hard sometimes. Father, forgive me. That easy. Now you can go on and say, Father, forgive me for my sins. Make me a new person. Help me to be more dedicated to you. Help me to start living the way I believe. And help me to have a hunger for your word. Because that's the only place in this world that we can see and experience truth. See, it's that easy, folks.
one of the sweetest prayers I ever heard was, I was listening to a guy pray, and he was praying, and it was right next to me, he was praying out loud, and finally he's like, peace out, Jesus. <laughs> that was his way of saying amen. Him and Jesus had a connection. It's not all about the rules. It's not all about what you got to look like, what you got to act like, what you got to do. It's not all about that. You can worry about that later. But right now, all you have to say is, Father, forgive me. And he will accept you in his family. And I'm thankful for that. At this time, I'm going to ask if they'll come back as we've seen. He lives. Page 264. 264, yes. I serve the risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is
point in the service, we are going to go through and do some prayer requests. Um, if you know of any, we'll ask some here a little bit later after we shut off the recording to add them to our prayer request list. This is some that's been given to me beforehand. Uh, there's several people that are struggling with cancer and fighting cancer right now. Um, some of those are Rebecca Whitaker. Uh, we also remember Bob Bash. Remember Jeff Rickenbacker. Uh, with liver melanoma. Continue to remember Bill Himes. He's the gentleman that came here a few uh, a couple months ago that I worked with Ohio State. He had a couple tumors on his vertebrae. He had surgery this past week and now is in rehab. Uh, continue to remember Kelly Rickle. Uh, and then continue to remember Jenny, which is a friend of Katie Curls. And then remember Austin Douglas. Continue to remember Vic Osmond. Continue to remember Dan also, uh, another friend of Katie's. And then continue to remember our missionary, Jenny Prime. Um, who is a Christian Union missionary and daughter of Lynn and Janet Prime. She has breast cancer and then also continue to remember Sammy Cooper. And then as we were over at the sunrise the service this morning, they mentioned Amy Knoll still doing chemo, so continue to remember her. And then also we have Tim Curtin and Karen Curtin. Continue to remember Melvin Donnell uh, with critical heart issues. Uh, continue to remember Walt Burke. Um, and I'll also remember Patty Heberling trying to get off oxygen so she can go back to work. Continue to remember Irene Strahl's ball. She's home on hospice. Remember that whole situation in Ukraine and Russia. Continue to remember Rod. Continue to remember Jenny Snyder. That's a friend of Joyce. Uh, she hopefully and will be having surgery at Lyman Memorial soon. Um, continue to remember Pat Geisner. She has non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver and they call in hospice. Continue to remember Nancy, which is John's mom, that she uh, she is getting better, but continue praying for her. Continue to remember Charlotte Lee. Continue to remember Brenda Watson. She took a bad, ball, a bad fall a few weeks ago. She's at rehab. I just heard from her this morning, and she's hoping that she gets to come home this week. So just remember her. I talked to Hilda this morning, and Dave's surgery went well, but uh, he wasn't doing real good yesterday, but he is doing better today, and they just ask that we continue praying for him. Uh, continue to remember Brian Morrison. His heart ablation went well this week. He's sore but doing good. I remember a friend of Bob McKee's. Uh, his name is Bob Baxter, and uh, he's got a deteriorating brain disease. And so, as you can imagine, that's not good. Also, remember any, uh, any other requests that I might have forgotten and any of the unspoken uh, that people have reached out. So, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you today. As I sit here and I bring my request to you, I think of another reason why it's important that we believe in your resurrection, that we believe that you're very much alive, because if, if we did not believe in your resurrection, we would just be talking into air. We, if we did not believe in the resurrection, it would be pointless to even be here this morning. So Lord, I'm thankful that we don't serve an idol. I'm thankful that we don't serve a piece of just an object, but we serve a God who is very much alive, a God who is very much involved in our lives, a God who cares about us enough to be able to send his only son to be able to die for us so that we will not have to. Lord, I just ask right now that we let these requests go to you, Lord. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do in these people's lives. We thank you for how you're going to work in their lives, Lord. And we just ask for encouragement for those that need encouragement healing for those that need healing. Lord, you know what these people need more than any of us, so Lord, we lay them at your feet and we give them completely over to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just a few quick announcements. If you're here and you um, are a member and you would like to give, there's offering plates back in the back um, and you can give to that. If you're a visitor, you don't have to give. We don't, you don't have to do that, but we'll take any donations that want to give. Um, and then also, if you are new to Heritage or you uh, um, haven't been coming real long, or maybe you would just like to be involved in some of the prayer requests or know what's happening, if you have a cell phone, it's easy as typing in the number 84576 to where you're sending it to, and then just type in Heritage CU, and then you can put in prayer requests, you can put in uh, announcements, you can put in other things. You can even put in your email if you'd rather get it through email or however. But again, that's Heritage CU to 84576. Um, if you're looking for ways to minister, there's a list of possible ministries you can do on the back of the bulletin. Um, if you're interested in doing one of these, talk to me. Also, there's a trustee sign-up list out in the foyer of things needing done around the church and the parsonage. 
One other thing before I forget. Uh, look forward to doing the onions. Questions, talk to Tom. Tom. If you have any questions, talk to Tom. Um, and then um, a week from tomorrow is the April Food Pantry. A week from tomorrow is the Raise your hand. If you don't know that, Tom, there's Tom. Me and Kim are leaving on Tuesday for vacation, and we won't be back until the following Wednesday, so we'll miss out on this month's food pantry. Um, and I'm going to be watching Mackenzie, so pray for her. And I'll let you figure out which her I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, we'll just pray that for safe travels as we go down there. But yeah, we're leaving Tuesday to go on vacation. But if anybody would like to help at the food pantry, that's next Monday from 1 to 3. And then this Wednesday at 7 p.m., we will be having Bible study at 7 p.m. here in the foyer. Everybody's welcome to come to that. And then next Sunday, you'll get the joy of hearing Rex Roth preach. And uh, I know it's been a little bit since he preached here, so I'm uh, looking forward to that. Um, and he will be here to give them the message as well. And then also, if you got any old tennis shoes laying around, you notice out there in the foyer, there's a box back there. I just took a big old garbage bag to, to Kathy Morris, who was with CEF. They'll take any kind of tennis shoes. They would love to do it. If they're doing it for a fundraiser. They get money even if you only have one of the tennis shoes. So clean out your closet, get rid of all your old tennis shoes. Women, while your husbands are at work, go ahead and go through and grab his old tennis shoes. And when you look for them, it's like, well, if you put them where they were or supposed to be, you would know. And then that way they'll be donated. So anyway, um, just be willing to get rid of all your old tennis shoes and go from there. Also, in two weeks, on May 1st, we will be having a business meeting right after church. Um, and then also that day, it's a busy day, uh, District Council will be over in Van Wert at Zion Christian Union at 5 p.m. as a meal, 6 p.m. as meeting and fellowship. And then also coming up May 12th through the 13th, that's the community-wide garage sales. If you guys get hungry around lunchtime or even for breakfast, stop up at Martin's Gas Station and stop by the Church in the Park fundraiser at Martin's from 9 a.m. to 2 on that Thursday and Friday, May 12th and 13th. Also, just looking ahead a little bit, the um, church camps will be in July. If anybody would like to go to church camps, talk to me, and I've got some flyers. They've got a couple of the drone dates on it, so I'm waiting on the real ones, but um, I'm sure that we can uh, get some help with paying for, uh, for those. We normally pay for half, um, so if you don't let money be an issue, if you'd like to go to church camp. And then um, if you are a man and you like to fish, and then we are doing the Christian Union Men's Week of Renewal, August 25th through September 3rd. It's a great getaway, and it's up in Canada, Eagle Falls Lodge. And we'd love to have you. If you have any questions about that, call and see myself or see Wayne here in the green jacket, and we'll be able to tell you about that as well. Um, again, we're going to close with prayer. And those of you that are here, we're going to uh, still talk to you a little bit, but we'll shut off the recording, and then uh, we'll talk to you guys a little bit. We won't keep you long after that, I promise. So let's pray. Father, we come to you today. Again, we're thankful for those that are watching online. We're thankful for all of those that are uh, able to watch for one reason or the other, or maybe watching after their services. Lord, we are thankful that they are watching, and we just pray for any needs that they have, anything that's going on in their lives. Just reach out and touch them. Reach out and help them to feel your presence, Lord. And Lord, you know what they need, so just help them to be able to reach out. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, if anybody has any needs this next week or so and you want something put on the prayer chain, I would say call the elders and let them know and they'll put it, get it put on the prayer chain. Um, but otherwise, we will see you in a couple weeks.